All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Darby Creek Church. Thanks for coming out. We're going to dive in here with Psalm 105. Let's turn our attention to the Lord and his word and just be reminded of what we're doing here this morning. This is Psalm 105, 1 through 4. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Amen. Let's, let's go to him in prayer right now as we, as we seek his face this morning. Now God, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you so much for who you are, God, and how good you've been to us. And we tell you, God, we just need you this morning, God. We need to learn to rest in you, God. We need to learn to, to seek you. We need your strength today. So pray that you would help us. Pray that you would just rekindle our, our passion for you and our love for you this morning. And help us, God, to draw near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. All right. If you're comfortable standing, let's stand on up and sing. It's good to seek him. It's good to draw near to him. 
This is Isaiah 40. It says, have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is in, unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Um, the Lord is the one that, that renews our strength. So let's make him the mountain where we run. And let's seek him right now. Make him the king of our heart as we sing.
don't you have a seat? Pastor Greg, come on up. Um, listen, let's go to the Lord. Let's, let's pray and ask for His help here as we get into His Word. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ that uh, He came down to this earth um, and He offered Himself up as a, as a sacrifice for our sins. He died in our place and, and uh, we're so thankful that uh, you, you did that so that we could have a relationship with you, God. And it's through Jesus that we have that relationship, through experiencing that forgiveness that Christ offers to us. And so, and uh, it's exciting to hear about that message getting around the world in places where people have not even heard the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would um, uh, bless uh, uh, that Run Global Ministry. Lord, bless them with what they need to reach the people there. They have that goal of reaching 30 million. Uh, in 10 years. And Lord, we are, uh, help us, Father, as uh, followers of Jesus, to be faithful with the opportunities you give us, to love the people around us, to show them Christ's love, and to communicate how they can have a relationship with the living God. Lord, we also want to take this time to lift up the people in our church family and friends who might just be in need of your healing touch today. Uh, we, we want to just say, Lord, pour out your healing power on them restore what's not working, what's broken. And uh, Lord, we also just pray uh, that you would help those that are maybe struggling uh, right now just to uh, just to get up in the morning. Maybe they're depressed, maybe they're discouraged. And, and Lord, would you fill them with hope as we go to your word this morning? Would you, by your spirit, uh, lift them up and help them to, uh, to see that there's hope in you? And uh, Lord, we just ask and pray that you would help us to hear what your Spirit has to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are uh, in the midst of a series uh, called The Ten Words. We're going through uh, and looking at the Ten Commandments there in Exodus chapter 20 and looking at how they apply to us today as followers of Jesus. And um, so uh, if you're able to, uh, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? This is a, a habit of ours at Darby Creek when we're reading the Word of God that we would stand in honor of it. And Today, let's go ahead and just read out loud together uh, this passage. So let's go ahead and read. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of the Lord. Please have a seat. So we're looking at the fourth commandment today, keeping the Sabbath. And as we just read about, uh, and what we're going to do, just to kind of give you a mental outline here, we're going to take, we have to look at what it was going on then, and what the Sabbath was to the Israelites. And so we'll look at what was the commandment, how was it to be carried out, and those verses even give us a why, why God was wanting them to keep the Sabbath. And then we'll take a look and answer the question, uh, how does the fourth commandment, uh, what does that have to do with us as Christians? Okay, so we're that's where we're going to look. So we'll get a little historical, and then we'll look uh, to us today, okay? Um, let's take a look at the what. The what. Well, the what is simply this. Remember the Sabbath, is what he told them. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy there in verse 8. Um, now, God's people, the Israelites, were to rest on the seventh day of the week, right? They were to work uh, the first six days and to rest on the seventh. And notice what he tells them to do. He says, remember it. Remember the Sabbath. Now, you got to realize uh, when he's saying remember it, it's not like just like bring it to mind, uh, but he's actually wanting them to show him that they remember it and to also show their love for God in a special way on that day. All right? Uh, think about it this way. If uh, you're married, think about your wedding anniversary, right? Uh, when a couple gets married and they celebrate their wedding anniversary, they're doing more than just remembering it, right? 
uh, I don't think Linda would like it if I just said, hey, I just want to let you know, I did remember our anniversary today, and then we just kind of went on with our day, right? And I wouldn't appreciate that either because it is to be a special day above all other days, right? Uh, typically, there would be uh, dinner out somewhere. There might be some flowers involved. Uh, you know, some people like chocolate. You know, some kind of a romantic evening, and that's defined in different ways by different people, right? But it's special. It's not like any other day. Um, Now, so in remembering your wedding anniversary, you're showing your spouse that that is a special day. It's not like any other. And so in a similar way, though, in remembering the Sabbath, God's people were to use that day of rest to show their love for God in special ways. So just think about, you know, in terms of what is the Sabbath. They're setting aside this one day in seven to show their God to love in special ways. So that remembering, remembering to keep the Sabbath. And then the part that says to keep it holy points to the fact that the Sabbath day uh, was to be like unlike the other days, right? Uh, one word for to keeping it holy is to mean to, is to be separated out and different from the others, all right? So, so we, we just saw what is the commandment, right? Keep, keep the Sabbath, uh, remember to keep the Sabbath and keep it holy. But now we're going to just talk about, well, well how? What the, the next verse kind of explains how God was expecting his people to um, show their love for him in special ways. And one is, uh, the how, part of the how is just that it was meant to be a day of worship and rest. Those two things, a day of worship and rest. Okay, now, when you look at uh, this a, a day set apart for the Lord, a day of worship, um, think about Luke, uh, excuse me, not Luke. Well, let's take a look back at this ver- the verses that we read, verses 9 and 10. Six days you shall labor, do all your work. Then verse 10 has the bulk of this how. It says, the seventh day is a, is, is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. And then it expands on that. Basically said, this extends to everybody. We don't want anybody to work, right? Um, so it's a day set apart for the Lord, a day of worship. Um, Notice how it says there in, in that verse, uh, verse 10, it says, a Sabbath to the Lord. A Sabbath to the Lord. So there really is a focus, a special focus on God that day. Now, you know, as believers, uh, we, wanna, we want God to be in every part of every day, right? That's, uh, in, in, in that sense, uh, it's not like saying that we don't want God to be a part of our lives uh, 24-7, 365. But on this particular day, God's people were to have special focus and have special time focused on God. Uh, Leviticus 23, verse 3, uh, includes in on how to carry out the Sabbath was to meet together. It says, there are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. So they were gathering together for a special gathering to worship the Lord. And so this was the expectation that one way that they were going to observe the Sabbath was to gather together to worship. Um, And then we see also in that commandment, uh, it's to be a day of rest. It's to be a day of rest. When you see uh, in verse 10, where it talked about, you know, it it would be a day of rest here. Let me pull it up again. It says that the, the seventh day is a day, Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Right? Uh, the opposite of work here we're talking about is, is rest, right? Is resting from what you normally do. And so this uh, concept of rest is really built into also the why. You know, why would God want us to rest? Why not just work seven days a week? Why take a day off? Um, and so that kind of gets into the why, right? So the, the what is the commandment is to keep the Sabbath day, make, keep it holy, right? And the how is by spending time gathering for worship and, and resting, right? So that's, that's the, uh, the how. And the why here is that God's creation pattern of work is work followed by rest. He set up this pattern. This is before even the giving of the law. This is before we have the giving of these uh, commandments, right? That God is, is telling his people that, uh, there's a pattern here. So let's take a look um, 
Let me go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. It says, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. So that's the creation, right? Uh, And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. In verse 3, it says, so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And so you just see that God is, is setting forth a pattern pattern, even before the giving of the law. Work followed by rest, right? It sets forth kind of a message to us that he made us how he wants us to live. He's designed us this way, not to continue to work, you know, without end, that we need to uh, take time off. We're we're not meant to work 24-7, 365. If that's how we operate, we're working against God's design uh, and we're going to miss out on the blessing he has for us for a Sabbath. Okay, And um, I don't know if you caught it, but in Genesis 2-2, or 2-3, he talks about how it was meant to be, he blessed that day, right? And then we have in Exodus 20, verse 11, it says, therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. There's something about when we take time to focus on God and we take time to rest and receive what he wants to have from him, that he gives us as a blessing. He blesses us for it. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm all for all the blessing I can get from God. And, uh, and so he, he wants us to see that this whole idea uh, of Sabbath rest was to be for a replenishing. It was to be for a renewal and a refueling. You can even see that in the Old Testament, right? Uh, Every seven years, there would be a rest on the land, right? You, you wouldn't work this particular field. You'd let it rest, right? And then every seven groupings of seven, the year of Jubilee, and everybody rest, and all the debts were reset, and all this stuff. It was just amazing. But in those patterns, you see the Sabbath woven throughout uh, the history of God's people, and there's something special that he has, a blessing that he wants to give by observing this principle of Sabbath rest. So, so having seen kind of the how, the what, and the why of this commandment, uh, let's try to take a look at this question, what does the fourth commandment mean for the Christian? What does this mean for us? Now, uh, I'm going to do a little, a little bit of a recap here because I've mentioned some of this in previous messages, but at this point it's good for us to mention it again. Um, as we mentioned in earlier in this series, Jesus' work on the cross and his subsequent resurrection from the dead has fulfilled the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. Right? So when, when you, we no longer offer sacrifices for sin anymore. Uh, we don't follow the ceremonial cleansing laws and so that because Christ, all those things were pointing to the unblemished land, the one who would cleanse us uh, from all unrighteousness. Right, and this is what's available to anyone. Right, this cleansing, this forgiveness uh, that Christ offers. This is why He came. This is why He died on the cross and rose again from the dead. All uh, so that we might have a relationship with God and be forgiven and cleansed uh, from all of our sins. And this is a, uh, a, a an incredible, an incredible gift. Right, that God offers to us through Jesus. So, uh, all that to say, because of that. Uh, we don't need to follow these Old Testament uh, ceremonial laws and, and sacrifices. We also don't need to follow the civil laws that govern how they, they uh, these specific laws on, on what they could do on certain days and so on. Um, and because, you know, unlike Israel, we were, we're not under a theocracy anymore. And so those laws don't necessarily apply to us, but there can be some principles you can get out of those, certainly, that you could carry forward. But um, nobody gets stoned to death anymore for not keeping the Sabbath today. Okay, we don't do that. So if you don't show up, don't look for somebody who would come with a bag of rocks. Okay, uh, but 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 just saying that you know there's uh, principles here that carry forward from the moral law. Okay, so we again there's the ceremonial law, there's the civil law, and then there's the moral law. And the moral law is forever. God's uh, what's right and wrong and. You know, love your neighbor and love God with all your heart. This is what Jesus even was saying as he gave a summary of the law when they asked, what is the greatest commandment, right? He says, the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
and, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and he's giving us, in, when Jesus said that, kind of the cliff notes on the Ten Commandments of, of the law. He said, well, this is the purpose of God's moral law, to love God and to love one another. Some people have even broken those Ten Commandments down into vertical and horizontal, right? Uh, loving God, the first four commandments. And then the, the other six is all about how we treat each other, how we love each other, right? And so, so I'm just trying to give you this, this uh, reminder that uh, we're carrying forward the moral law, but Jesus has fulfilled the, these um, ceremonial requirements in the Old Testament. All right. So, um, in mentioning all this, basically what we're saying is Jesus' saving work has transformed the Sabbath. He's transformed it in a number of ways, okay? Um, <clears throat> give you a couple of them here. One way that Jesus transformed the Sabbath is the day on which believers gather for worship, right? Uh, we gather together on the first day of the week, right? Well, why do we do that? Well, because Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Right? We know that from the Gospels, it says, on the first day of the week. And then they talk about the resurrection. Right? Um, and so then we also know that this was the pattern of the early church, that they gathered together on the first day. As you read through the book of Acts and so on, you'll see that pattern. And it was all in honor of uh, recognizing the importance of the resurrection and of the Lord Jesus. Right? Another way that Jesus transforms the Sabbath is uh, we kind of give it a new name. We call it the Lord's Day, right? This is the Lord's Day, right? Uh, uh, Sunday, the first day of the week is the Lord's Day, and we celebrate Him. Um, now, that doesn't mean that, that uh, God doesn't want us to uh, experience and, and, and see the benefits of the principle of the Sabbath. Jesus actually didn't throw out the Sabbath. He did give some good clarification, though. Okay, He gave some really good clarifications on the Sabbath because as oftentimes as humans, we kind of complicate things and we, we want to know exactly what it means to keep the Sabbath and not keep the Sabbath. right? Um, and so when it says not to do any work, right? well, then the, the, the religious leaders decided they needed to define some more specifics on what it meant to work. Right? Is picking up a stick, is that work? Is walking from here to there, is that work? And they had all these rules that weren't in the Scripture, but were kind of codified in this other book to try to explain those things, right? In other words, if, if, if Skip's house was like, you know, uh, 2,000 yards from my house, I don't know what the measurements were, but, you know, and maybe that wasn't work. But to go beyond that, it was work to walk past his house. Unless I had some things at his house. And that would extend my range. You see how crazy this is? And it, I mean, that's just a simple example. Um, and so the religious leaders were, by trying, I suppose, in some ways, trying to be helpful, they were being hurtful. They were getting the focus on what it was about, right? Uh, rather than resting and renewing and, and worshiping, they turned it into legalism, right? Um, now, let me just mention to you, uh, speaking of Jesus and how he kind of give some explanation on this. Let's go to Mark chapter 2, verse 23. This, uh, one Sabbath, he was going, he meaning Jesus, was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Right? They're saying, hey, you're breaking one of the rules that we made up. You know, what you're doing here, you know, is work. Okay? Um, I heard one pastor say that that looks like theft to me, <laughs> but 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 actually you're you're allowed to legally to 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 glean some food off the edges of the field even if you were passing through that was allowed right. Um, so it was really more of the work that was at issue here. Verse twenty five, and he said to them, "Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? Because that's what they were. Him and his disciples were in need and hungry. He he and those who were with him." Uh, it says, he, he, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he also gave it to those who were with him. So he's like, hey, I got an example to show you that you know, God didn't judge those guys for what they did in their need. And verse 27, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, 
not man for the Sabbath. Then he says, so the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. Now there's a lot in this passage, but I just want to focus in on this one statement here. In that Jesus is saying, listen, you guys are missing the point. Uh, This Sabbath is meant to be a blessing to you, not a curse. It's not to be a burden to you. And in fact, if you read in Matthew chapter 11 at the very end, right before he gives Matthew's rendition of the same passage, you know what what he says? Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Why is he saying that right before he goes into this? He's saying this because, you know, you guys are all trying to be working your way to be right with me. All you have to do is come to me. You come to me. I'll forgive your sin. You're trying to do all these things to, to work it out yourself. But I'm the one who's come. I'm, the, in a sense, the Sabbath fulfillment for you. You'll kind of find rest for your soul. Uh, you'll find rest from the burdens of all the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they're trying to place upon you. These extra burdens, rules, right? You know, and I, I would suppose that there was definitely a time in my life before becoming Christian where I thought, that, you know, <clears throat> having a relationship with God, how you would get to that and how you would go to heaven is if I simply, um, if my good outweighed my bad. I just tried to be as good as I could, and as long as I wasn't, you know, like a Charlie Manson or something, I would be okay. Uh, but that's not what God is looking to. He's just looking to say, has my sin been taken care of or has it not? Have I taken on the yoke of Christ, right? Which he says in that passage in Matthew 11, he says his, his burden is easy, his burden is light. Join up with Jesus, right? Let him bear your sin. Life is free. You see that? How so much more, so much different than the religious leaders of the day who were trying to weigh down the people with a heavy load of rules. Okay? And so, so Jesus turns this, in a sense, on his head. He tried to get the focus back on this Sabbath principle to be, it was meant for us, right? Have you ever heard uh, the phrase, you know, we, the, the, the tail is wagging the dog instead of the dog wagging the tail, right? It's backwards, right? Uh, the, the dog is supposed to wag the tail, right? Uh, well, here the Sabbath is meant to, to be a blessing to us, not to be a heavy burden. It's most, meant to help us, not the other way around, okay? And that's what Jesus is saying. All right, so he's bringing attention to the fact that the Sabbath was meant to be a blessing. All right, and so um, now, again, Jesus, I don't think, is throwing out this principle of Sabbath, but he is giving, uh, showing what the intended purpose is. Okay, so I would say that, okay, on the Lord's Day, for most people, that's the day that you're worshiping together, right? And that you're doing things that maybe you typically don't do. Um, And and I just want to share with you some ways, these are not rules, but some examples, some ways that you might want to honor the Sabbath principle in your life and in your family. Now, I was not the originator of these, but uh, some time ago, uh, our association of churches that we had been with there, they had a speaker in, Peter Scazzaro, and he's written this book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And a whole other series, emotionally spirit, emotionally healthy leadership, emotionally healthy discipleship, but it's about you can guess emotional health, right? Spiritual emotional health. And one of the things he focused in on and spoke at our pastors' conference on was this idea of the Sabbath principle and how you know when you're a leader and you're leading something, uh, so sometimes and just like any anybody else, you're a lot of times you're just thinking about work, 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 and people especially who are in ministry think that the more they work, the more it looks, you know, it, that, that they're, they're, I don't know, they're getting brownie points or they, they're like you know, spiritual work. So it's, you know, why would I stop that? Um, but let me just give you four things that uh, he kind of shares here on ways that we could uh, observe uh, the blessings of the Sabbath. Uh, I don't, some of this I'm just going to read for you. The first word, there's four words, stop. Stop is the first word. Uh, Sabbath is first and foremost a day when we cease all work, paid and unpaid. On the Sabbath, we embrace our limits. You know, when you say, I'm not going to work today, you're basically saying, I don't have to keep working every day to get everything done. That It's like I'm saying, okay, I'm trusting God that 
uh, he'll help me get that stuff done, right? Because there's always, isn't there always more to do, right? There's always more to do, uh, whether at your paid job or other responsibilities. And I'd say, you know, if you're a, a stay-at-home parent uh, on your Sabbath, you might want to consider uh, just engaging in stuff that's other than what you normally do. That might uh, require your spouse to maybe do some of those things instead of you or something as an idea. But we need to stop. We need to recognize that we'll never finish all our goals, all our projects, and that God is on the throne managing quite well when we're taking a break. Okay? And that's, by the way, it's very freeing. Uh, for some people, it might be kind of freakish because maybe you're just you know, type A and love to just check those things off your list uh, and get it done. But, but it's very freeing when we're able to slow the RPMs down and, and stop and cease from work. Um, now, uh, the second thing, second word is rest. So what, once we stop uh, and we accept God's invitation to rest, uh, we, we're basically, again, modeling what, what God himself did. We engage in activities that restore and replenish us. It's not, I don't think it's not like we're supposed to have a list of things you can't do. You want to do things that are going to fill your tanks, that are going to replenish your soul, replenish your spirit, um, your physical being. I mean, I, I'll just give you an example. My wife and I, we like to ride bikes. Sat, so, you know, this is a work day for me, by the way. Um, and, and so, you know, does that mean I'm violating the Sabbath? No. In fact, Jesus points this out in Matthew chapter 12. He says, even the priests, you know, they're, they're not in trouble for working on the Sabbath. So, but what we do is we do things that we enjoy that uh, are going to refresh us. So we ride bikes. Yesterday we took a ride out at Three Creeks Park, and, uh, which is down near where we live, and just out in nature, riding around, you know, and it was great. It was refreshing. Um, and, you know, I spent some time yesterday weeding, and so did she. I don't like weeding so much, but it was, it's not something I normally do. That's probably the problem. Okay, it was, uh, so, but I didn't feel bad about weeding. Uh, you know, I was like, ah, I think I need to probably do that. But also, we'll take some time, typically, to, um, and this kind of gets, this one in the rest, Rest and the next word, delight, kind of go hand in hand. Um, delight, it says uh, in, in Genesis 131, after finishing his work of creation, God pronounced it very good. Um, and he says, this is not an anemic thought, how, how, well, how well and nice did we do that, but a joyful recognition and celebration of accomplishment. As part of observing Sabbath, God invites us to join in the celebration to enjoy and delight in his creation and all the gifts he offers us in it, right? So just enjoying all that God has blessed you with, all that he has there for you. Um, I know uh, Pete mentions uh, creation here. He says, as part of practicing, preparing to practice Sabbath, one of the most important questions to consider is, what gives me joy and delight? Only you can answer that. Uh, what gives you joy and delight? Engage in those activities. Uh, on the Lord's Day, okay? Um, and for Linda and I, we do that on Saturday a lot of the time. Um, and so, and, and you know, we shouldn't get all caught up on the days. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, actually, Paul points this out. We, holding one day above another, we really don't have to worry about this. But I think the thing is, is that we should gather together for worship, and we should take uh, a day off somewhere. Okay. Uh, we've got people here that work in the medical industry, and, and uh, they have to work on Sundays sometimes, right? And so that's no judgment there. Um, you know, but you just got to figure out on those weeks that you're working on a Sunday, you know, or if that would normally be your day of rest, try to figure out another time when you're going to get when you're going to get replenished. Okay, that you don't just keep going, right? Like like you don't need to be replenished. Okay, so stop, rest. And by the way, on that rest, uh, and again, this is not a rule, but don't engage in things that just suck the life out of you, okay? For me, sometimes social media does that, okay? For others, it doesn't. Like, but, and so I'm saying it's not a rule. It's like you just got to figure out, like, this kind of just gets me discouraged or this gets me, you know, bummed out or maybe it's the news for you. I don't know. I, don't, I just, I don't know. But 
you know, you just want to try to kind of at least set that aside uh, if it does, if it's not wrestle for you. Now, the last one, uh, the last word is contemplate. Contemplate. Pondering the love of God is central to the focus of our Sabbaths, he says. He says, uh, what makes a Sabbath a biblical Sabbath is that it's holy to the Lord, like we mentioned before. We are not, we are not taking time off from God. We are taking time to draw closer to God, right? That's what we should be doing uh, on, our, on our Sabbath as we're observing this principle of Sabbath. We want to grow closer to God. And sometimes, uh, again, just as an example, there might be other ways you'll do this, but Lynn and I will spend a little extra time with the Lord that day. Uh, we've got this place of our house, we call it the Jesus Nook. And we go up there and we sit with our coffee and we have books that we read and we just spend time with God more than what we normally do on a given day. And just trying to think about, and sometimes you might want, if you journal, you might want to look back over the week and contemplate the ways that God has worked in your heart or things that he's shown you that maybe you forgot about uh, that he wants to bring to remembrance. So, um, and I'll just end with this, quoting a little bit more here. It says, um, he says, Sabbath is an invitation to see the invisible in the visible, to recognize the hidden ways God's goodness is at work in our lives. I don't know about you, but I kind of miss the things that God is sometimes doing in my life and around me if I don't stop and, and think. Um, I, those things kind of fall to the side in the midst of the busyness, right? It does not mean that we necessarily spend the entire day in prayer or studying Scripture, though those activities may be part of a Sabbath day. Instead, contemplation means we're uh, acutely focused on those aspects of God's love that come to us through so many gifts from His hand. Scripture affirms that all creation declares the glory of God in Psalm 19.1. So, so these four words, I think, are good, good, good words. Stop, rest, and delight and contemplate to get us thinking about what in those categories is going to help you uh, observe a principle of Sabbath rest and not be legalistic about it, right? And remembering, um, and one of the biggest things I took away from the conference that I mentioned that Pete was at was that he was saying, you know, it's really up to you if you're going to receive the gift of the Sabbath. Right? It's up to you. It's your choice, right? Do you, do you want to... To, to, to approach it as it's a gift that God has for you to replenish your soul, to draw close to Him, to worship with His people, or I could choose to not, not do that, and I would not receive that blessing that comes from it. But, but just see it as a, it's meant to be a blessing, not a burden. Amen? All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much that uh, You have given us uh, this principle as believers. Uh, to be replenished. Uh, thank you that even Jesus clarified some things for us there. Uh, but that you have from the beginning said to us that you've created us to live in this rhythm of work and rest. Six days we work, one day we rest. Father, help us to, to not fight against the design, but help us to embrace it and receive the blessing for which it was meant to be. Father, help us to uh, spend time, whether it's today or whatever day we uh, have time where we're not working, where we can just reflect on your goodness and reflect on the fact that as believers, we don't have to work our way to heaven. We don't have to work our way into good, your good graces, but it's by receiving the gift that Christ offers of forgiveness that we enter into uh, this relationship and we'll be able to enter into what Hebrews says is that final rest. That, uh, that eternal rest with you, God, in heaven. So, Lord, help us to take these things uh, and what your Spirit is putting on our hearts uh, to put into practice. Help us to be faithful. Help us to not let those words fall to the ground. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You shall find rest for your souls. Amen. Let's sing one more song to him.
Drink of the water. 